Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Episcopal Church. I'm Kay Sylvester, I'm the rector here at St. Paul's and I bid you welcome in the name of Christ. I'm here to wish you a happy Pride Sunday. We join churches around the country in celebrating pride. What I want you to hear today is that no matter who you are, no matter what your journey has looked like, no matter who you love or how you're made, you are made in the image and likeness of God. God loves you and God gives you strength and gifts to be of service to the world around you. The church has not always been kind, especially to folks on the LGBTQ spectrum. And today we want to say specifically, you are welcome, you are loved, and the entire church celebrates the gifts that God gives us each and all. Let's worship. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. God of all creation, 
you have made us in your image, a rainbow of every color, culture, gender expression, language, orientation, and nation. Grant that when we look at one another, we may see you expressed in yet another language of love and grant that we may honor your holy presence in every life. We pray because of Jesus, who shows us the way. Amen. A reading from the book of Samuel. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son, Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jashar. He said, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O oh, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Wild Geese by Mary Oliver you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things.
The good news of Jesus according to Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jarius came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now, there was a woman suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under her many physicians and had spent all she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Then when he entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and get, began to walk about. She was about 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Savior. In the name of God, who calls us to her, even when we feel ashamed of who we are. Amen. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed. Shame, a common feeling among people and an even more common one among LGBTQ plus people, especially those who have been raised in religious communities. Billy Porter, an actor most known for his character Pray Tell in the TV series Pose, recently said in an interview that the first thing that is taken away from us as LGBT people is our spirituality. The woman in today's gospel reading had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, which would have left her cut off from her community. She would have felt ashamed in such a similar way. For so long, I'm sure she felt like something had been taken away from her. But something stirred in her that day to go out and to find Jesus. She had probably been hearing rumors of this Jewish rabbi, mystic, and miracle worker that was coming to her town. 
and she thought, this is my chance. And she was right. She was healed. But as soon as Jesus questions who touched him, she cowers in fear because she feels ashamed and she thinks that she has done something that she is not supposed to do. But instead, Jesus looks at her, and I'm sure he even smiled, and says, your faith has made you well. And so for so many of us who are a part of the LGBT community and who are Christian, this has been a similar experience. For so long, we have been pushed out of churches and denominations and have been told that we are unworthy of God's love. But we still find that there is that stirring within us, the Holy Spirit drawing us back, that desire for us to want a relationship with God. And so, for so many of us, we have been lucky and we have been able to find a parish that is open and affirming, like this one. I hesitate bringing this up today because I'm aware that I'm giving a sermon on Pride Sunday within a parish that is open and affirming, within a diocese that is open and affirming, within a denomination that is open and affirming. There is no need to make an argument because we are already there. But I do bring this up because I think it is easy to think that we have won but we haven't. It is still considered the norm for a majority of churches to not be accepting of LGBT people. And instead, it's the norm to condemn us for who we are. We have not truly won, while we are still surprised to see churches at pride festivals in a supportive manner, or be surprised at the fact like a church like ours is having a Pride Sunday service, or surprised to see ordained LGBT people serving in church. Last week, the Catholic Church won a case before the Supreme Court that allowed them to discriminate against same-gender couples in adoption and foster care services on the basis of religious freedom. We are presently seeing an onslaught against transgender rights in state legislatures, where bills have been put into law that would ban trans individuals from playing in sports and would prohibit trans individuals from being able to access trans-affirming medical care. And many politicians will still use the Bible and their faith in order to further their bigotry. I have often heard people weaponize passages in Genesis when women and man were created in order to further bigotry against trans people, saying that there can only be two genders and that it is sinful to be trans because God did not intend it. Because male and female, he created them, they say. And while it does say that God created male and female, I would like to remind us that God created day and night, but we still do not deny that dawn and dusk are moments in time. And bread and wine are necessary for the Eucharist, but God first gave us wheat and grapes, which we make into bread and wine because God desires that we take part in creation. And I bring responses like this up Because as a starting point, as LGBT Christians, we often first look to unravel these clobber passages that have been used to condemn us, which is a good starting point. But we cannot end there, because not only is there no place in Scripture, and I repeat, no place in Scripture that condemns LGBTQ plus people, but Scripture affirms us and we are found in scripture too. Now, as a student of gender and sexuality studies, I would kick myself if I didn't add 
that the way we define sexuality and gender identity is entirely different from the time and culture of the Bible. The terms we use today would not fit in then, but that doesn't mean that same gender attracted people and people who fall outside of the gender that they were assigned at birth did not exist at that time. So this brings me to our Old Testament reading today. This reading comes in the aftermath of the death of Saul and Jonathan in a battle against the Philistines. And the reading we hear is a lamentation over Saul and Jonathan by David. Now you might have missed it, but let's go back to the last few verses. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Now, queer theologians have been quick to discuss this verse, and for good reason, because much of the story of David and Jonathan is rich with scenes that queer people relate to. In the story of David and Jonathan, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 18 that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And a couple of verses later, we read that the, then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Knit to the soul of David. I can't help but think of how many couples have described themselves in a similar way. David and Jonathan are examples of same gender love in the Bible. And it is important to point this out because it shows us that LGBTQ plus people are not outsiders to scripture. We can see ourselves in scripture and relate to the stories within it. That's the good news to think about today, that Jesus reminds us that we are worthy even when the world and powerful institutions make us feel otherwise. Jesus and the rest of scripture remind us that we are filled with worth and dignity. And even though scripture contains stories from centuries ago, they still speak to us and can fill us with hope today. LGBT people are present in scripture and are present in the history of Christianity. Pauli Murray, the first African-American woman to be ordained in the Episcopal Church in 1977. Murray was a civil rights lawyer and a women's rights activist prior to becoming ordained. She identified as a lesbian, but based on her writings, scholars speculate that she probably would have been considered transgender, a term that wasn't fully articulated during that time period. Murray's achievements and contributions have earned her a spot on the Episcopal calendar of saints, and she is commemorated on July 1st. Jean Robinson in 2003 became the first openly gay man to be elected as a bishop in the Episcopal Church. An election that was not without controversy. Robinson needed to wear a bulletproof vest during his consecration and often wore one afterward during his service as a bishop due to death threats made against his life. I bring Murray and Robinson up because I want to emphasize that LGBT people are not only present in scripture as we find with David and Jonathan, but also present in the life of the church. LGBT people are not only welcomed, but needed and called by God to the church. And I want to add our presiding bishop, Michael Curry's response to the recent Supreme Court decision Fulton v. Philadelphia, the one I had mentioned earlier. Bishop Curry says, My heart is with my LGBTQ siblings 
in light of today's ruling by the Supreme Court in Fulton v. Philadelphia. For us, the affirmation of equal rights for all people is a moral and religious conviction. It is grounded in the Bible, which declares that all people have been created equally in the image of God. LGBTQ siblings, we stand with you in this moment and we continue to affirm that you are and have always been a blessing to our church. But above all, you are children of God with the entire human family. The struggle does not end here. The work goes on and we are committed to the fullness of human equality and to building a just future that is free from discrimination against LGBTQ people. We are also concerned for the impact of this ruling on the foster care system, in which so many Episcopalians offer shelter and care to vulnerable children, many of whom are LGBTQ themselves. It is important to remember that the New Testament teaches that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows and their distress." End quote. God loves LGBTQ people, not in spite of our identities, but loves us because that is how God has intended us to be. Caring and welcoming LGBTQ people is a necessary stance that we are called to do as Christians. Refusing to take a side or to allow other people to twist scripture in order to push bigotry is not acceptable. In a world in which transphobia and homophobia is normalized and expected in churches, it is necessary to proclaim again and again and again that God loves, God calls, and God welcomes LGBTQ people. Amen. Now let us affirm our faith together. We believe in God, the love that holds the world together. We believe in love, known to us in Jesus. We believe in Jesus, who fed the multitudes, who taught God's kingdom of justice and peace, who breathed God's very spirit upon his friends. We believe in God's spirit, who moves in the world to lead us to teach us and empower us to do the work of love today. There are no barriers to love. There is always love enough and more. Love makes us, love heals us, love makes us grow. God's love comes to us on the way to someone else. We believe in God who creates us in the image of love. Since God loves us so much, we ought also to love one another. Amen. The Prayers of the People. In silence and peace, I invite your prayers of thanks, remembering those whose courage has made a difference in the world. In silence and peace, I invite your prayerful intention for those who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit. In silence and peace, I invite your prayerful intention for members of our LGBTQ community who struggle for acceptance and inclusion. In silence and peace, I invite your prayers for communities that have been violated by violence, for our neighbors struggling for food, shelter, and dignity, and for our efforts to be loving neighbors and steadfast friends who walk beside them. In silence and peace, I invite your prayers for the many places in the world 
where the pandemic still rages unchecked, where violence drives people from their homes, where people struggle for clean water, sanitation, and land to grow food. In silence and peace, I invite your prayers for and attention to our deteriorating planet, our forests and oceans, and all the creatures endangered by our overuse of the planet's resources. In silence and peace, I invite your prayerful intention for those whose lives are linked with ours, family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and this community of faith. In silence and peace, I invite your prayerful intention for yourself. May the Spirit open your heart to love and grace. We reflect on the difficult times of this week and seek the strength to become our most compassionate selves. We have wounded your love. O oh God, heal us. We stumble in the darkness. Light of God, transfigure us. We forget that we are your home. Spirit of God, dwell in us. Eternal Spirit, living God, in whom we live and move and have our being, all that we are, have been, and will be, is known to you, to the very secret of our hearts and all that rises to trouble us. Living flame, burn into us. Cleansing wind, blow through us. Fountain of water, well up within us, that we may love and praise in deed and in truth. Amen. God's grace is for you. You are loved and forgiven. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for your continual support of St. Paul's. In order to make a contribution, please visit our website, stpauls.org, and use the donate button. Let us with gladness present the offerings of our labor to God for blessing.
May God give you the grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Fabulous people of God, go forth rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.